So today I'm going to be talking about um, some of the technologies that we've been working with uh, for in situ detection of uh, SARS-CoV-2 RNA. And this work has been a large collaborative effort um, amongst many labs um, listed here. You can see it's, we worked with Arjun Raj, Dave Isidore, Kathleen Montone, Sarah Cherry, and Conrad Coleman, but also others. And I'll try to highlight those as we go along and at the end. In situ hybridization technologies, they offer um, some really unique opportunities when targeting uh, viruses. And these are just two examples of some previous work that um, I did uh, using these technologies in the context of virology. Uh, the first, the image on the left, uh, is an example of, a, of a, 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 a nasopharyngeal swab. And out of this nasopharyngeal swab, we're detecting adenovirus using a rapid technology that uh, we were evaluating as a diagnostic assay at the time. Um, in the other image, you can see um, this is a field of cells, and they've been infected with both influenza and influ influenza A and influenza B. And through uh, bioinformatic uh, clever tricks for probe design, we were able to design probes that allowed us to target one virus and not the other and prove that we could uh, discriminate these different uh, viral subtypes. And, um, you know, uh, we can design probes off of uh, these principles to be uh, very specific for a particular sequence. And so for SARS-CoV-2, we've been working with uh, two primary technologies. The first one is a single molecule RNA fish, and the second one is hybridization chain reaction B3. And they have these their own strengths and weaknesses, and we've identified um, different uh, applications for these two technologies. Uh, RNA fish is very straightforward. Uh, we design uh, DNA oligos that are complementary to the RNA that we're interested in. So here, in this case, it's the genome, uh, the RNA, and the virus. And we actually design a, a set of these, and we tile them along the RNA. Each one gets a fluorescent dye, as labeled by the yellow dot here. Um, and um, it's through the localization of them all where the transcripts sit that produces very bright signal. So if you have one probe that is off target or binds other places, it really doesn't matter. So it makes it really robust um, because it's the co-localization of all of them that provides specificity. The other uh, feature of this technology is that um, it's really fast. The hybridization process under the right conditions can go really quickly. And so um, that is really powerful in thinking about diagnostics because it's not dependent on an incubation with an enzyme. Uh, it's also a direct detection, so there's no amplification um, with this uh, technology. The other method we've been using, however, um, is based on amplification, and uh, it's actually this method called HCRV3 that came out of Niles Pierce's lab. And we really like it um, because while it does have amplification, we find that it's very specific um, and it works really well, or we've been able to get it working really well in um, preserved tissues, um, particularly from autopsy. And so the basic principle behind this technology is that, that it has uh, two of these, these two DNA base probes that sit side by side to each other. And the specificity is, achieving, is achieved through having both of them next to each other and requiring both of them to get amplification. Each one has these little arms that provide a landing pad for RNA hairpins that open up and provide a, create a platform for a linear amplification from there. Um, and uh, this, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it can get really bright. Uh, it's very specific off of these two, these two base probes being next to each other. And you can put many of these along the RNA that you're interested in. And more recently, we've been working with them uh, to look at different junctions, because you can put one on one side of a junction and one on the other side of the junction. And you can then identify transcripts from the unique junction as well. Um, so when going after, or when trying to design probes for the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, we, uh, we designed probes uh, all the way down to the, or down at the ORF1A region of the virus so that we could get um, specifically the full length um, viral transcript. We also designed probes to the N and the E as we would have, uh, for these we would have, we would have um, the full length transcript, but we would also make, we would also have them targeting the subgenomic uh, RNAs that are made by the virus. And um, in thinking about in situ detection, we identified uh, two particular, two specific applications uh, for these technologies. The first uh, is diagnostics, as I've kind of alluded to already, uh, and this is just based off of the fact that the RNA fish is really fast in direct detection. The other application that we've been thinking about is um, looking in auto or working with is uh, looking in autopsy tissues to try to use this technology to identify what cell types are actually getting infected um, from these tissues. 
Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be autopsy. It could also be biopsies or other preserved tissues that are uh, coming uh, from these patients. Um, and in these assays or in this, these designs, what we can do is we can design our probes that target the virus, but we can also design probes that um, are targeting the host. And we can tar target genes from the host that allow us to know what cell types or that tell us important things about the host response to the virus. So we can um, do all of these things simultaneously. And then, as I mentioned, the technology that we're working with is compatible with FFPE. And then we can go after different viral transcripts or unique viral junctions, such as the subgenomic transcripts as well with this technology. So just to start to validate these and show that these are working, we worked with uh, Sarah Cherry, and she set up for us uh, a mock infected sample and an infected sample in her BSL-3 facility. You can see this is a field of cells that are not infected with the virus. This is the mock infection, and they have no uh, probe signal. But when you infect the cells with the virus, uh, the probes generate a very bright fluorescent signal that is specific to the infected cells. And this is using the rapid technology, the five-minute assay that I mentioned, or this was off of a five-minute assay. And uh, using the probes that target the different parts of the genome, uh, uh, the, of the virus, you can see that there's different localizations to where the ORF1A sits, where it has more, closer to the nucleus around the periphery of the nucleus, and where the N sits, filling the whole cytoplasm. And if I toggle back and forth, you can see the differences. And here's just another close-up image of those um, it, down uh, at the individual cells. So to begin to evaluate this as a diagnostic, we collaborated with uh, Ron Coleman and got a series of samples uh, from COVID-19 patients. We got both oropharyngeal and uh, nasopharyngeal swabs, and we found that we were able to get um, the best signal out of the nasopharyngeal swabs. And so of all the positive samples that we had, we were able to, in all but one, I believe, um, find a viral signal. And that's what you're looking at here. It looks very different from cell culture. Um, it doesn't, you know, the cells are much smaller, first of all. Um, and you can see we also have done a number of different controls and tricks to try to uh, prove specificity. Uh, we've done controls to prove that these are intact cells that we're seeing the virus in, and that's what these, the, the image on the left is, just to prove the cells are alive. And then the one next to it is the virus. And these are just other examples of the same thing um, where we have the controls and the virus side by side. But this did present uh, many challenges, some of which we're still very much working on. Uh, we had sources of nonspecific signal. Um, we had probes that were nonspecifically sticking to dying cells. Um, and these are all things that we're using both experimental and computational approaches to work through. The other thing that we're working on um, is trying to improve sample processing, because in our initial studies, we were working with one slide at a time prepared very low throughput. So now we're uh, David Isidore's lab and Arjun Raj's lab to be able to try to put this into a multi-well plate such that we could uh, do multiplex sample processing and it's processing um, all at once and make it um, more high throughput. The other thing that I'm interested in is, as I mentioned, uh, looking in autopsy tissues. And we had started actually preparing to look in autopsy for other applications uh, with these technologies right before um, everything, before the lab shut down. And we had one successful experiment that looked beautiful. And then we, uh, you know, the lab had to such a shutdown and they start kind of come back up. Um, has started to come back up and we've been able to reproduce this and get these working really uh, nicely through the hard work of Jonathan Lee and Kofi Achiampong. Um, so they, as their first target, as the first tissue they looked at, they got from Dr. Becky Lim, a uh, placenta that had tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 um, by PCR. And we were able to, in this tissue, identify uh, the virus. Uh, we could see um, where it was localized in the tissue. You can see these, uh, here you're looking at a big image scan on the left, and then on the right you're looking at a zoom in and the white signal in those cells is the virus. We're also able to align these up with uh, H&E images, and this allowed the pathologist to be able to tell us that it was the trophoblasts that were actually uh, having the infection. And now we're coming in um, with the cell type specific markers to do further analysis and to look at other things and look at the uh, response as well um, in the tissue. And um, the other type of tissue that we uh, have been working with recently um, has, has been a series of uh, lung autopsy tissues. And I should say we have now looked at uh, a total of eight cases, and this is the only one that had a really large amount of signal 
And you can see what we noticed is that there was in this case uh, two different patterns of signal. There were these cells that were more rounded looking and then we had cells that um, had this different morphology. And so we went to a single cell, uh, we went to some single cell RNA-seq data to pick cell type specific markers that had high expression levels such that we could go back into the lung and say, what cells are the cells that, are, that have this infection? And so these are the three markers that we picked. Marco is a macrophage marker, this SFTPC for type 2 pneumocytes, and AGER for type 1 pneumocytes. Um, and this is just showing that the type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes are different cells, but that they nicely localize in the tissue. And what we found is that um, the virus was localizing with two of those markers that we were looking at. The virus was localizing with Marco, the macrophage marker. And you can see here on the left, you have the viral signal. And on the right, you have the Marco signal. We were able to show that this cell type is the macrophages in this tissue. And then, um, in, and then the other cell type that was uh, identified as infected was uh, this, uh, the type 2 pneumocyte cell. And here you can see on the left, again, the viral signal, and on the right, the cell type specific marker. That was uh, how we were able to, but we did not see it in the uh, type 1 pneumocyte cells in this tissue. From um, the same case, we also got some additional tissue. Um, and one of the tissue types of tissue that we looked at um, also had a large amount of viral signal, and that was the lymph node. Um, so here you're looking at a, a, a large scan of the lymph node section that we looked at. And the white signal is again the virus, and you can see it's in these long strips down the tissue. Um, and if you look at the zoom in, you can see close up what it looks like inside of the cells. And so this uh, experiment was uh, done, you know, by two people in my lab this week. Um, and so this is new, and we're going to start to identify the different um, cell types in this tissue as well. Also going forward, you know, we're uh, starting to look in other tissues and um, continue processing uh, additional, looking at additional sites and additional cases um, to try to figure out it, it to what extent um, it can infect different cell types from patient to patient, what are all the cell types it can infect, um, and how, how much variation is there. And so um, I should it, a wrap up and acknowledge uh, the people that did this work. This has been, as I mentioned, a collaboration between many different labs. But um, in my lab, uh, Ben Emmert and Kofi Achiampong um, have really uh, done a lot of the tissue work, with, uh, also with Jonathan Lake as well, um, and really uh, pushed that forward um, more recently. And we've had um, funding support um, from the IRM, the PATH Department, Bioengineering, and the Dean's Innovation Fund. Um, so with that, I will uh, take questions. Um, OK. So I actually have one question. In the tissue, can we try to detect anything by um, by antibodies? Is there enough there to detect, say, viral antibodies or cell type markers? Just curious. Uh, um, the RNA, or you mean with a with an um, antibody? I mean with the protein antibody. Do you know if you if there's enough virus there that you could actually detect it with an antibody to, Probably. to a viral? I would guess so. That. Yeah, I don't know for sure. I've never done it, but I would. I would really guess so. I would. I would assume so for sure. Okay. Um, and so we haven't done this with IF ourselves, but this works with IF in principle, and um, we're planning to try it with the ACE2 antibodies that everybody's been working with as well soon. Okay. Um, is Marcos is Marcos specific to alveolar macrophages or other uh, myeloid lineages? I think it's just alveolar macrophages, but I'm not 100 percent sure about that. Yeah, uh, okay. we picked it off that lung single cell CGRNA data set, but um, yeah, 